All right. We're here today with Corey Heimel. Corey, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. What I'd love to do is just kick off. If you could maybe just take a minute to introduce yourself and what you all do at Gigster. Yeah, of course. So I am the VP of product and research uh, at a firm called Gigster. We've been around for about 10 years now. Uh, and we were kind of founded on the thesis that the future of work will be distributed and that it will also uh, be very heavily leveraged by the human cloud. Um, so we looked at that problem and said, well, how do we deal with globalization and dealing with teams around the planet? Uh, and we saw it as a data and tooling problem. So over the past 10 years, we do a, have been doing a lot of work into research and building a lot of tools and data sets and machine learning and AI algorithms that let you run any type of team that is global uh, while trying to reduce risk. So a lot of people ask what we do, like technically Gixter HQ is a kind of a data and research company. And we apply that tooling process and research to custom software development, which is what we kind of chose as our first case study. So we do a lot of custom dev, which mm -hmm. <laughs> is in the name, a lot yeah. of areas in like AI, blockchain, you know, Web3, enterprise dev. So kind of across the board, but with a little bit of, a little bit of different flavor, I like to think of it. Awesome. Thank you. And I love the the more objective approach. We do a lot a lot of conversations on this show. A lot of the the, the voices are more, I would say, on the softer side and the mm -hmm. compassionate side and the meaningful side. But it's not that you don't believe in that, but it's really great to have this technical um, angle as well. So I'm really curious then to hear, you know, your reflection on this statement. The employee employer relationship is broken. How do you respond to that comment? And what do you think you attribute to your beliefs? Yeah. So the employee employer relationship is in a weird spot. You know, I don't, I don't know if broken is the word, but I think that the status quo has changed significantly. Uh, you hear a lot uh, nowadays in the news around, you know, the, the, the quiet quitting, the mass resignations. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that what happened was really that with, with COVID and the, the, you know, the, the going remote that a lot of ideas and understanding of what people saw as traditional way of, of working was, was shifted very fast. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say, you know, the traditional ways of working, obviously on site is the, is the main one that comes to mind. Uh, but there's also a lot of different kind of management pra practices and principles that come with running distributed teams uh, that many companies were not prepared for and still, mm -hmm. you know, are has still kind of taken them uh, a little off guard. And what that does is is does fragment that employee employer relationship. So that that's where we see some of the biggest uh, kind of hiccups, I think, mm -hmm. in that in that area. I think the future will be interesting in how businesses are able to adapt to, to solve those problems. Absolutely. And you, you're just making mention of current events. You know, one thing that the pandemic has shown us is that businesses are woefully unprepared to create a sense of culture and create high performing distributed teams. You know, never mind getting into fractional work, which we'll get into in a moment. Like, but how, like, when you think about this in the tooling that you're all doing, like, how should leaders be approaching this problem differently? Yeah, I mean, the idea of building culture in remote teams to many seems like really daunting. And like, there's been people that said that you can't do it. But I think a fascinating thing to look at, and I'll use, you know, since we're where we are today, like with, with blockchain and Web3, you saw massive communities organize quickly, um, sometimes, you know, within a matter of days with, with tens of thousands of users, they're able to organize around a central topic that they were all extremely enthusiastic about. They found ways for them to work together, all while a majority of them were anonymous, right? And these are people that were very passionate around a single idea, had super, super strong cultures. Uh, and again, like the crazy part is that a lot of them are anonymous. So, you know, to look at the future of work and say it's going to be distributed and make the argument that it's that it's you can't build culture is really a false kind of narrative. I think what a lot of it is is that people don't know how to build culture mm. uh, in massively distributed teams. And I think that, that at the same time too, there's an adjustment of what the definition of culture means. Uh, you know, when you think about, you know, I think I was living out in San Francisco during, you know, height of like the the startup, you know, revolution <laughs> where, you know, everyone was, oh, you know, I've got, we both have shirts on now, but like walking around head to toe and company swag and like yeah. your life and your identity was really ingrained in the job that you did. And to companies that was culture. It's that we need people here all the time. 
you know, they served as breakfast, lunch, and dinners. They had daycare for your kids. The idea was that you, if your identity was tied close enough to the business, that's the, that is a strong culture, which that uh, is, is again, a bit of a, I think a false pretense or a kind of archaic idea of what culture means. So when businesses are looking to building culture in the future, it's important to define what culture really means. Yeah. And knowing that it's not going, it's not that, but it is something new is really one of the first steps that companies have to take uh, in order to begin making the right inroads and steps to build a level of, um, I would call it, you know, employee buy-in to the larger mm-hmm. mission. Makes sense. So I was doing some research prior to this call, right? And to see that the work that you are doing, that Gigster is doing, I mean, founded 10 years ago, right? And I think a lot of people attribute like, oh, the pandemic happened and now work has changed, right? But the trend was already happening, right? The world was already changing and the pandemic simply accelerated that trend. And kind of what gets my, you know, I have a strong visceral reaction to all this chatter about like the future of work is remote work and this technology. Like it's like, yes, but there's something greater happening, right? Let's Mm -hmm. talk about the future, like 10 years from now, 20 years from now, what do you think building a company and working looks like then? Yeah. I mean, the, there's two areas to it. Right. And when we think about what the future of work like truly means um, or like, what does the future of business really look like? Mm-hmm. Um, I've kind of got two, two opinions on it, you know, on the, the future of business side, I think that's something that's super interesting to take note of is again, I'll, I'll keep tying it back to the web three just because it's such a yeah. interesting place to pull, I think data from but when we look at what the future of companies will be, I do believe and predict that a large number of companies will be, adopting and forming under what you call like a DAO hybrid model, um, meaning that your business has a core, right? It has a core group of hierarchical um, employees that are able to make day-to-day decisions. But many companies will have large portions of their business that are made up by these kind of elastic and fluid Mm -hmm. workforces where people are able to kind of move in and out seamlessly uh, and contribute when and where they want. And what that lets businesses do is be much more, I would call, you know, stable during economic times, meaning that you're not running a super high cost bench. You're able to take advantage of people that may be more aligned to work mm-hmm. with your business from a passion side rather than like a, I'm here for a paycheck side. And it's also, you know, it pairs well with, I think, future expectations from the job market that, you know, a lot of it's kind of a inherent I don't want to say like right that technology has given new generations coming in, but especially in the knowledge worker field um, that you can kind of have that option to move in and out. So from an organizational side and organizational change, I think that businesses will change deeply Uh, from the workforce in general, though, like we firmly believe that the future of work is an extremely liquid type of community. Again, kind Mm -hmm. of tying to the Dow example that individuals will be moving in and out of a lot of different roles, sometime on a day-to-day basis, maybe a week-to-week or month-to-month mm. basis. But the idea of being locked into a single company for extended periods of time uh, will kind of no longer be the social norm. Um, of course, some, I mean, and again, I'm speaking more specifically to like knowledge workers in the yeah. tech field, because that's where I live. Like, of course, if you're a school teacher, yes. you're not going <laughs> to, maybe if you're a sub, you're kind of <laughs> moving in and out of a couple of different places, but really yeah. sp- specifically to that field. Uh, And that has to happen, right? Like there's a huge, huge talent gap that exists now that's only going to get deeper. So you really have to start thinking about from a business side, how do you cater and build and adjust your incentives for, to attract talent and how do you, you know, kind of enable them. Uh, So there's a lot of change on the horizon. I love that. And I love the, the word you use fluidity. Mm -hmm. Um, And you just mentioned too. So let's talk about the next generation of workers. Right. So there's all the hubbub right now of a uh, AI chat GPT. It's going to kill us. It's going to take our jobs. Right. Um, the World Economic Forum put out a report a couple of weeks ago like that said, yeah, it's probably going to kill about 80 million jobs, but it's going to create at least 90 million. I think it will create a lot more. Right. So like what kind of skills and competencies do you think will be coveted in this new future of work that looks to be very distributed. Yeah, that's I mean that's a great question, right? And so when you look at when you look at things like ChatGPT or, or really AI in general, you know, I was around when it first kind of caught wave a number of years ago and there was the same fear of oh my gosh, it's going to come and 
destroy everything, right? Uh, what a lot of people fail to kind of realize is that the whole goal, AI is really good at doing low level kind of repeatable tasks, right? That that mm-hmm. humans really don't deserve to be doing. And when I say don't deserve to be doing, it's that like, it's so easy. Like as a human, you you should be working on things more complex. Like you are a human being, you're the pinnacle of what our known spaces, like there's no reason that you should be doing little automated data entry, right? Like go do something cooler. So a lot of times, you know, the, the perception of AI, it's going to take jobs and it very well may, uh, but a lot of times those jobs should free up that workforce to do more complex abstract thinking types of roles that AI can't do. And so when we look at like what type of roles and things will be coming up in the future, I mean, there's a lot of like hard examples. I think one of the newest one is like a, you know, a prompt engineer, Basically, mm-hmm. someone that's able to query uh, machine learning or AI models right. and get the best type of response out. Obviously, a new field there. I think there's going to be a lot in the, maybe a lot more springing up in the data tagging, you know, type of area because mm-hmm. again, you have to feed a AI information that humans are able to curate for it to learn to some degree. So I think that's a couple other areas, but from more abstract position, right? Like there's still AI is it's it, the models when they're built, they're very, they're hyper-focused to one type of task. You know, there's a form of AI called general AI, uh, which is basically the notion of when an AI model becomes uh, better than a human in, in basically all aspects. And that's, we're nowhere mm-hmm. near that, but that's the one when you hear about Elon Musk or other people saying that AI is extremely dangerous, that is the form of AI that they're talking about current AI that we have is like hyper-focused stuff. So, you know, ChatGPT was built to form, you know, a large language model to respond with text like a human, but it can't draw comparisons between that and other areas, right? Like it can't connect the dots like a human can. So in the future, like, yes, there will always be people um, needed to work with these machines. And Deloitte actually calls our current kind of tech area, the age of with, meaning that this is a fundamental time of how humans work with technology, you know, rather than working against it. That's, that's the kind of narrative to keep in the mind. And hopefully we never get to a point where we work for (laughs) technology. (laughs) Right. Right. It brings about the notion of there's AI and then there's IA, which is intelligence augmentation. And like, you know, is it actually assisting Mm -hmm. what what we're doing? Taking just a quick beat, for our audience, right, most people, right, we're, you know, you're talking about Web3, you're talking about DAOs. Let's just start with Web3 for a second. If you were to simplify <laughs> in um, in lay people's terms, just give me, give the audience a sense of like, what is Web3 and why should we care about it? Sure. Um, yeah. So the best way to explain it that I've found resonates uh, is kind of to explain the web in three epochs or eras. So web 1.0, the original web that came out of I don't know, DARPA or something forever ago was called like the static web, meaning that you went online, everything that there was static, meaning someone typed in up a web page and you went and view it and you basically just read. Web 2.0, which was kind of like the social sharing web, uh, is what we live in now ish, right? We have web three, but like web two ish yeah. has been over the previous times where you have platforms that facilitate user creation. So like for mm-hmm. instance, Facebook does not create any content. They just build the platform and then its users generates the billions of posts that goes up on it. Google does not create any web pages. They just facilitate a platform that indexes them. Uh, and that's our WordPress or our blog sites, you know, mm-hmm. Twitter, anything out there is these big companies that just build a platform that facilitate users to go and create and consume. And that's been the web that we've lived in for a long time. Now, though, those webs are great, but, you know, web one and web two was all founded on this premise and this notion of copy, share, paste, mm-hmm. you know, everything is open. Uh, and it was really, really good, but it kind of hit this precipice of it can't grow anymore until you find some way to prove ownership. So in Web2, there's no way to know really where an image started or who owns it or or anything of that nature. So you kind of cap out from an economic level how large this system can grow. And so Web3, really the, the whole great thing about Web3 and the only real difference is, is that you can prove ownership of a digital asset. It sounds super simple, right? It's powered, you know, the ability to prove ownership of an image or a JPEG, right? Mm -hmm. is powered through the blockchain. Now you might be looking at that and be like, well, that's not as cool as everyone made it sound. Like that's kind of, that's kind of lame. But if you think about it, the whole reason our entire economy, right? And I would, I would even argue that a large portion of civilization is able to 
even exist is because the ability to prove ownership. You can prove that you own land. You can prove that you did work. You can prove that you have money. You can prove that you have credit. You can prove that you have done all of these things. And that has allowed, you know, basically systemic growth as a species. And Web3 now has that kind of kernel of you can prov- you can have digital proof that you own something or you created some value or you bought and sold some asset. Uh, And with that, you're able to extrapolate it out into a lot of crazy ideas and cool stuff. The first port of call and, you know, being able to prove you own something was currency, right? Bitcoin. From there, there was Ether and another other coins. And then the next thing was like, I want to prove like some unique asset a la NFTs. And then people looked at that and said, well, cool. If you guys can prove that, like, I want to have some digital land. Now you have this notion of a meta, you know, quote unquote metaverse. And well, we can put things in it or we can have roles or systems or jobs or companies and all this kind of stuff stemming out of this one ability to provide and and improve provenance of ownership. Um, And that is the big leap forward that Web3 um, has taken. That might be a little much, so I'll stop there because I can rant on that for... (laughs) No, I think think what what you bring to light is there's this notion of, to your point, there's proof of Mm -hmm. ownership. Then there's also digital traceable portability. Yes, exactly right. Right, um, exactly. which which I view probably also as one of the the main benefits of Web three in, mm-hmm. infrastructure. Yeah, interoperability is going to be is huge, right? Um, because then in that so interoperability kind of the other leg I think of that topic is that someone would come in and be like decentralization, you know, d- you know, down with centrality. Uh, and that is a piece of it, but it's really that provenance of ownership that's super, super important in my mind. So I, I want you to go on a journey with me. So this this interoperability, this portability component is something that I've been passionate about. In the world of work, performance measurement is woefully unsophisticated inside organizations, right? We're using like Likert scales and like 360 reviews and we're like, Corey, we give you a five and they're like, okay, what, the, what does that mean? How are you measuring my performance? And then you, you let's let's say you're an engineer at um, one software company, same industry vertical, and you go to another one, and the way that they measure midterm performance is completely different. And then let's say you put yourself out in the job market, and you have your LinkedIn profile, you have you have something else, you essentially have this resume that is not validated at all. What are your thoughts on the positive side of Web three and p- the, the potential benefit of being able to use this technology to have portable performance measurement? Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's a great question, right? So the idea of using Web3 and blockchain to track your achievements, right, over time uh, is something that is extremely exciting to see. You know, I've been, I've kind of consulted on a number of projects, right, that are looking to see how can you build workplace credentialing that's put on chain. So just, you know, kind of to the point of that, whenever you move in between companies, you can take that history with you. And if we think about, you know, how we perceive the future of work as being more fluid and people actually moving in and out of jobs more frequently, you almost have to have that. And you need this anchoring mechanism to measure people at some common level. We have that currently in the, in the regular world. It's like a college degree, right? Like it's kind of like a baseline. Everyone can look at it and be like, all right, you got a degree. So I can, I know that some level that this guy can do something or a girl can woman or they them can mm-hmm. do something. That idea of workplace credentialing, I think is super, is a really, really super fascinating thought exercise to run through. You mentioned kind of the, uh, you know, the idea of like, how do you baseline and normalize against different companies and expectations is something that has to be solved. You know, how do you, I I think there's mechanisms and mechanics that, you know, have to be developed around, you know, keeping fraud out to some level, but I think that there are options to it. Right. And we're actually doing pretty interesting study right now with Stanford that kind of revolves around algorithmic ranking opacities impact the networks. And basically how does having some form of a ranking system affect members of a network? Is it good? Is it bad? Uh, Does it incentivize positive or negative behavior? If there's different factors within that, how does that affect different behavioral traits of people, especially if they're, if they are uh, what we call part of the fluid workforce? Um, So there's a lot there. I I, I think it's really important, but it it kind of starts to twist my brain. I think when I, (laughs) when I think too much about it, so it's a great area for someone to look into. Yeah, absolutely. Um, could you 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 mentioned the notion of a DAO? Could you explain for the audience what a DAO is and what the implications are from a business standpoint? Of course, yeah. So a DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. 
Uh, and the whole kind of premise is, is that with the Web3 and a lot of the blockchain side, um, many said, wow, we've got a great you know, way, again, to, pr- to prove provenance or ownership. We've got our own you know, form of currency now, whether that's Ether or Bitcoin or whatever it might be. We should think of like a new way to kind of organize and be able to do it quickly, be able to do it anonymously and be able to do it effectively. And basically what a DAO is, is you can think of it as a, you know, an LLC made up of tons of different members where decisions are voted upon by a community. Work is compensated, you know, out to those doing it based on, you know, peer reviews and kind of publicly verifiable levels of effort. Um, and a lot of people hear that and they're like, well, that sounds ridiculous because it is crazy, but it, but it worked. Right. And that's the general premise. And like the DAO in a, in its purest form is that every decision is voted on by the community. You know, work is done by whoever, and they are all fairly compensated for the work that was created. Uh, you know, malicious actors are able to, you know, be pushed out a lot of these things. Right. And that's the like pure DAO. Now it's what we believe is that from a business standpoint that I don't believe that a pure DAO works substantially Mm. well from a business standpoint. I do think that the concept of a hybrid DAO, which is basically where you say, okay, well, we know how an LLC as as an example works. There are mechanics from a DAO that are very interesting to look at, whether that's, you know, around how do they incentivize participation? How do they incentivize engagement? How do they able to make like very creative decisions at scale? You know, how are they able to execute against ideas quickly? A lot of things that you can take from a business leader's perspective and adopt into your existing corporation or organization. Absolutely. Thank you for that explanation. So freelance and fractional work, right? I believe it's paving the way for revolutionizing what the future employer-employee contract looks like, even just outside of Web3, Upwork, right, just recently announced that you can now engage workers full-time on their platform. There's also been a rising trend in just new signal activity around, like, union activity. Like, there's something shaking here. What do you think this speak says about you know, the the future of at will employment, the future of at will employment is an interesting one, right? Like we, you know, when you think about it, it's kind of, and these are, this is like one, so at will employment, I think is one of those like topics where I am probably not the best to speak on it, mostly because sitting from a position of privilege and means, it's kind of hard for me to say, well, you know, I can take off if I don't want to, or I've got a a skill set to go work somewhere else. And I know that it doesn't cross over to all worlds. So it's, that one's a tough one for me to like, I think objectively comment on. Okay. Fair. Fair. Do you think it's possible to run a company a hundred percent on fractional or gig work? I don't believe it's 100% possible uh, to run a company on strictly fractional or gig work. Uh, the main reason why, and you know, coming from me, whose job <laughs> it is, is to <laughs> enable <laughs> fractional work <laughs> and gig and get gig, gig workers, is that you know what I've seen is that it's it's very important to have that like base level of continuity within any idea or organization or business or initiative, really in general. Doesn't have to be a business. And if you're leveraging fractional workers, you also need to keep in your mind that you are leveraging volatility and fluidity, right? So the whole idea is is that you are not trying to keep them around forever. um, And you are trying to compartmentalize your work and your idea and your dream and your vision and your roadmap in a way that can be executed by fractional workers, but it needs some level of orchestration to, at, at least from what I've seen, be successful. Yeah, I, I I tend to agree. You know, having this debate with with folks about can you and some are like absolutely, and I'm like, well, you probably don't. I mean, the word company itself, is, you know, <laughs> implies that you have more than one person. So if you mm-hmm. build 100 percent on fractional, you know, yeah, and it's yeah. like when you say fractional too, right? Like someone might be like, well, you know, I work on it part time, and then I hire fractional workers, therefore we're all exactly. fractional. Yeah. It's like, but you are still like, if you have one person there. And fractional means that like everyone is churning, 
Yep. And in this case, if you're there all the time, then it's you're not a fractional worker. You are whether you're 40 hours or not, you are a main thread that doesn't leave. I love that uh, what you just said, the, the concept of like everyone is churning because it is gig work, right? So therefore it's fractional work. There is there's gonna be <laughs> they're, to they're not churning, then it's not fractional work. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you know, just kind of like getting towards the end of our time here. What's what's interesting about this, right, is most career development services today, the whole industry around like developing your skills and and everything else, for the most part, it's subsidized by the employer or expected to be paid by the employer. And therefore, the employer is is the beneficiary, right? We're we're seeing this trend even in like, I think it's crazy that some talent agencies today, they're not talent agencies, they represent businesses, they're business Mm -hmm. agencies, and they try to find talent. All of this is changing, right? So do you think we'll start to see a greater shift towards services, career development, like empowered and owned by the individual in this future? Yeah, I think so, right? And I think that it has to be. And I also think that there's, in my mind, that in that that there's going to be a whole new crop of businesses, right? That are that pop up and like like mind, right? It's like it's an app, it's something else, right? That people that basically is able to orchestrate fractional work at scale, mm-hmm. uh, meaning that if you are a fractional worker, you can sign up, and they will basically find these pockets of work that you can go do. And then they will kind of like place you in those really easy. And that can be done like algorithmically. It doesn't need to be a person, but like a platform or service is able to do that. So I do think that that is there. I do think that we'll start being like independent firms that are focused on career growth, right? Like if Mm -hmm. you want to grow in this direction, you know, and you know that you're going to kind of be laterally moving left and right a lot, having a firm that can help coach you just like a financial advisor, you know, will, will probably be there as well. But it's an interesting thought to think about. And I actually haven't thought about that one in a long time in a long time it's definitely will be something sure and so to to, to close us out when, when we think about that the notion of like self-empowerment in your own career development journey you're you're essentially placing bets on yourself and tooling yourself up for future earning potential that brings to light this whole notion of value you were talking about how even like web3 in a decentralized even down model changes the way we think about compensation so if we were to end on value, how should we be thinking about the value of a human in the work context? Like what would that exercise be to understand what are you worth? Well, that is a, that is meta. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, so when we think about how do you put value on a human, I think it's a really I mean, that's a deeper like philosophical question, right? And I think that the value of a human's work output can be measured in kind of multiple ways, right? It could be measured in market value, right? It's like, you know, if you're producing some Mm -hmm. asset, what will the market pay for your time to create said asset? I think that there is a little bit different, especially when you get into the knowledge worker side of the house especially when we talk about leveraging in AI, in AI and like other tools that are coming to market, that kind of clean math equation of, you know, time put in and, you know, output here plus mm-hmm. times market value uh, starts to get a little skewed, meaning that, you know, these AI tools are able to vastly increase the amount of value individuals are able to create in a shorter mm-hmm. amount of time. Um, so there's also, you know, kind of the the context of the of the market value. I think that there's context of like peer value, right? Like how much do you add to the system as a whole? And then, you know, there might be uh, some other areas that this is actually the first time I've I've kind of thought of it in this way. So it's a really, really good question. Um, Some other like value areas that, that might start to kind of show itself, right? Like my brain kind of runs into in a much more, you know, 1099 fractional type Mm -hmm. of world, you know, does, you know, are you able to like measure at an individual level, like economic impact that they're providing, Mm -hmm. right? So at a state value level, what is this person worth? Uh, And that might all get reconciled into some, this is your paycheck type of thing, or this is what Mm -hmm. you're paying them. But it is a really good question to think about because at the end of the day, like anyone that's hiring or paying someone to do something is basically putting a call option that you will the value you get out will be higher than what you pay them. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, like, why do it? Um, mm-hmm. And that that may be value that they output. It may be the t- value is the time that you're saved not doing it. Uh, but at the end of the day, that is what purchasing um, yeah. 
is. So I think that definition was going to be very interesting for me to <laughs> think on today. Thanks for going on that journey with me. Um, is there anything else you think we should talk about or we should share with the audience? Uh, no, I, I, look, these were great questions. And this was a really, really good um, conversation. You know, the, the future of work is something that is gets thrown, or, thrown around a lot. There's multiple definitions. You know, I think that anyone listening, you heard my POV yeah. um, on it, but definitely listen to others because there's a lot of different angles and ways people are seeing it uh, and excited to see, you know, how the how the world turns tomorrow. Awesome. Corey, thank you. Thank you.